No, that's that's a new topic. That's uh, the first thing is uh, first basic thing is what is reaction kinetics? Kinetics. That's uh, that's rate of reactions. Rate of reaction. Rate. How fast is the reaction? Whenever you have a reaction, uh, it depends on uh, collisions. Like reactions happen because of collisions. Like you have these molecules, the red ones, and you've got these uh, green ones. Why does the reaction happen? Because the particles can kind of uh, move around and they can bump into each other. So collisions, everything is revolving around. It's revolving around collisions. So collisions, that is what leads to a reaction. What happens when molecules collide? Old bonds are broken and new bonds are formed. And you have got you've got new bonds that are forming. Now when you when you talk about when you talk about these collisions, just give me one second. When you talk about these collisions, uh, collisions, the two factors that on which collisions depend. Okay, so it's not just collisions or bumping into each other. Uh, when collisions happen, uh, you need two things. You, you need to figure out uh, how frequently they're bumping into each other. So it depends on the frequency. Like if they're bumping into each other very, very slowly and over a very long period of time, the reaction is obviously going to be slow because the reaction uh, depends on these collisions. And the second one is the effectiveness of the collisions. Like we know that they are colliding with each other, but uh, is there a reaction happening? Whether the collisions are going to be successful or not. So maybe they're bumping into into each other a, like at a very high frequency, and they're bumping into each other a lot. But maybe uh, the old bonds are not getting broken, and if they are not being broken, then the reaction might not happen at all, even though collisions are happening. So two things: it's the frequency and the effectiveness or successfulness of the collisions. Uh, both are independent of each other. Uh, you can have a very high frequency of collisions and absolutely no effectiveness, absolutely zero reaction. Or maybe you have a very low frequency of collisions, but uh, the effectiveness of the collisions is a lot and that leads to a reaction. So it depends on both things and both things are kind of independent of each other. So the, the five factors that on which rate of reaction depends, the first one is obviously temperature. And somebody's mic is on. So that is temperature. Now temperature is uh, when you increase temperature. Why does the reaction speed up? And remember, uh, if you increase temperature, but well, you forget that I increase temperature by 10 degrees centigrade, the rate of reaction doubles. Usually. And just so higher temperature, why is the reaction faster? Because you've got more kinetic energy. And if you have more kinetic energy, both things are going to be, you'll have more frequency. The bu they'll be bumping into each other a lot more. And they would be bumping into each other with a lot more energy. So there's a higher chance of the old bonds getting broken and new bonds getting formed because they've got more kinetic energy. So, so both frequency and effectiveness of collisions increase. Is this clear? Yes, yeah, sir. So 
so both of them both frequency and effectiveness increases second one the second one is uh, pressure uh, remember that pressure only it's only a factor for gases So only matters for gases. Uh, gases are the only things that are compressible. So only gases compress. Like if you've got a you've got a container, and that container has a bunch of uh, gas molecules. So here's a, I mean, that's the top. Oh, let's center it. So, the, and I'm trying to compress it. I'm putting pressure. And there are a bunch of molecules. Like, initially, the molecules are, like, really far away. Uh, but if I compress it, and if I put pressure, what's going to happen is that the particles will, will have to... Uh, I mean, they're going, to, they're going to be pushed closer to each other. So that is what happens with, at higher pressure. So at higher pressure, you increase pressure, volume decreases. And when volume decreases, particles are now closer to each other. Particles are closer to each other, and uh, if they are closer to each other, they're going to bump into each other a lot more. So, so you'll have uh, uh, a higher frequency of collisions. So frequency increases. And remember, not the effectiveness. Like, they're not more energetic, so they'll be bumping bumping into each other a lot more, but uh, they'll be bumping into, into each other with the same force. Uh, so the effectiveness does not increase. Number three is uh, you add, uh, uh, you can talk about surface area. Uh, that's number three, when you have a higher surface area. Uh, what you get is uh, when you have a higher surface area, powdered or small pieces, they always have a higher surface area. So I'll just quickly go over this. Uh, you'll just have more frequent collisions only. Effectiveness does not increase. Uh, powdered, uh, more particles are exposed than they would be able to react. If you've got big chunks, uh, then there's, then if you've got a big chunk, then the outer layer could react, but the inner particles cannot react. So the number of collisions would decrease because the inner particles cannot react. And number four is uh, concentration. Now, for concentration, the rule is, it's the first thing, whenever you hear the term concentration, it only applies to uh, solutions or gases. Remember, apart from solutions, uh, solids and liquids don't, are going to have constant concentration. Like if you take water, water has constant concentration.
Now, uh, the first thing is you ha you have to understand what concentration is. Concentration is simply how it's the closeness of the particles. That is what concentration is. Like if you have a beaker and you've got uh, another one. Okay, so here's, here's your second beaker. And it's got two solutions. So the term concentration refers to refers to how close the particles are. Like you have a, let's say you've got two beakers. One of them is dilute, one of them is more concentrated. So if the particles are really close together, that means they have higher concentration, which is fairly obvious. Uh, but it only changes in solids and liquids. Not not in solids and liquids. It uh, it changes in in uh, uh, the term concentration only applies to solutions and gases. You can't you can't apply it to solids because in solids the spacing is always fixed. Like if you have a solid lattice, the spacing is always fixed. I mean their concentration is not going to change. It's uh, it's always the same. Like the particles are still always close together, so they're all always tightly packed in solids. So the spacing never changes. Uh, the spacing changes in solutions when something is dissolved in water or it changes in gases. It doesn't even change in liquids. Like if you have uh, uh, H2O liquid in a container, now in H2O liquid, again, uh, what's basically happening is uh, like if I can. That the spacing never changes. I mean, maybe this one. Like even in solids and liquids, this. I mean, they're still close together. It's only in gases that the particles can be far apart or they can be close together that the spacing really changes. Um, in solids and liquids, they're always tightly packed, so uh, there's not a lot of change in this in the in how far or close they are. As so now the last one, let's talk about uh, the fifth one, which is a catalyst. Okay, let's talk about that in a bit more detail. So what does a catalyst do? A catalyst, what it does is that it uh, reduces actuation energy. So it reduces actuation energy and speeds up speeds up the reaction and in the process remains unchanged does not change itself it remains unchanged now the thing with catalyst is uh, how does it work first thing what it does is it increases the effectiveness of the collisions does not change frequency like you had 100 collisions now you still have 100 collisions in the previous case out of the 100 collisions uh, five of them led to a reaction but now you still have 100 collisions and uh, 20 of them they it leads to a reaction so it increases effectiveness of collisions it most of the time doesn't affect the frequency Is this clear? Sound clear? Ethan, is this clear? Zoha? Yes, sir. I said that's what a catalyst does. It reduces actuation energy, uh, increases the effectiveness or successfulness of the collisions. Uh, doesn't affect like the amount of collisions. They remain kind of the same. So the question is, how does a catalyst work? Now there are two types of catalysts. Uh, Remember, in any reaction, uh, you have to break bonds and then you have to form bonds. So, so there are two types of catalyst. Uh, you've got heterogeneous catalyst. So you've got heterogeneous catalyst, and in a heterogeneous catalyst, uh, 
the reactants and the catalyst have a different state. Now they're going to have they're going to have different states. Uh, an example for that is the Haber process. Like you have a N two molecule, it reacts with three H two molecules, and it produces two H three molecules. If he's used as a catalyst. N2 is a gas, H2 is also a gas, and NH3 is also a gas. So the states are different. Just hold on, wait one minute. As I said, let's uh, start uh, this again. Ki you had uh, this reaction, and you needed an you needed an Fe catalyst, right? So in this case, uh, this is an example of heterogeneous catalyst that the catalyst and the reactants have a different state. Catalyst is a solid. The reactants over here in this case are gases. So you've got a triple bond, and it's got uh, it's got a pretty strong bond, difficult to break. It's got high activation energy, so the reaction is pretty slow without the catalyst, uh, there's going to be less effective collisions. Like it would be very hard for them to break the triple bond. So most of the time, even if you have a collision, it's just not going to be effective enough. Like there would be absolutely no reaction. The triple bond will not break. TK, is this clear? Right, Nabila, is this clear? Sohail, is this clear? Yes. So um, initially there's no reaction, but what happens if you add a catalyst? The two things that are going to happen and that's known as adsorption and deadsorption. So it's got something to do with transition metals. Transition metals are pretty good catalysts. So how can transition metal uh, speed up the reaction? Like how can it do that? Like a transition metal metal has a has a triple bond. Uh, like the N has a triple bond. How could the transition metal help you break that? So transition metals are good catalysts. Why? Because if you look at metals, like you've got potassium, that's 19 protons. You got uh, calcium, which is 20 protons. And in the same row, you would meet iron, which has 26 protons. 
you would meet other transition metals like copper, which has 29 protons. So what happens when you move towards uh, from group one to and group two? Like group one metals, they really like to lose electrons. Group two metals also kind of they're reactive. They like to lose electrons. But when you reach these transition metals, they kind of have more protons. That's the word. That's why they have this word transition with them because now you're transitioning from metals to non-metals. Non-metals on the other hand, like if you have a non-metal on the other side, like bromine, bromine has got 37 protons, right? I think 35 protons. So it likes to gain electrons. Group one li likes to lose electrons because it has fewer protons. So it doesn't really attract its electrons very strongly. Bromine, on the other hand, uh, really likes to gain electrons because it's got more protons. Now, transition metals are kind of transitioning. You're transitioning from a metal, reactive metal, to a reactive non-metal. So they've got more protons. So they develop this slight, they have this slight tendency to attract electrons. A very slight, not, they're not like non-metals. Non-metals attract electrons very strongly. So uh, they have the, this very, very tiny, slight tendency to attract electrons. For example, gold never gives up its electrons. Like gold is unreactive. The reason gold is unreactive is because it doesn't like to, it's, it's got more protons. It's got more protons, it, it's got a stronger attraction for electrons. So it doesn't really like to form ions. Same case with platinum, platinum also has a pretty strong attraction for electrons. So it, it's not willing to let go of its electrons. Iron is unreactive as well to quite an extent, like you use iron as a metal in, in a lot of places. It doesn't react, it's not very reactive. Similarly, copper wise, they're very, very kind of unreactive. Uh, so copper doesn't like to lose electrons. Instead, because of the higher number of protons, they have this slight tendency to attract electrons. Uh, is this point clear? Yes. yes. So they have this very slight, very slight, not like non-metals. Non-metals have a pretty strong tendency to attract electrons. They instead gain electrons. They just have this very tiny slight attraction for electrons. So imagine you've got this iron over here with, this, with its 26 protons. And here's a nitrogen molecule that's approaching it with its pretty strong triple bond. And here's an H2 molecule, uh, which obviously doesn't have a very strong bond. So both these molecules are trying to, I mean, they're bumping into the iron catalyst that you've added. What's going to happen is that there are six electrons in the triple bond. Iron would slightly start pulling on those electrons. Similarly, there are electrons in the HH bond. If he would start to slightly attract those electrons, very slightly. So when these molecules, they bump into iron, this is what's going to happen that uh, the electrons in the triple bond, either some of them or all of them, they will, what will happen is they will get attracted to the iron. So the electrons that, are, that, that were part of the triple bond, they would slowly get pulled or attracted towards towards the iron. Same case with H, the electrons that were present in the bond over there, they would slightly get attracted to the iron over here. Is this point clear? Yes. TK to the rest, is this clear? Nabila, is this clear? Minahil, Ethan, uh, Zoha, is this clear? Yes, sir. So this is what's going on, that you had a triple bond, which was pretty hard to break otherwise. But iron started pulling on those electrons. Like iron had this weak attraction for those electrons. Uh, it wasn't a strong attraction. So the electrons kind of, uh, there might be some electrons still getting shared, right? Maybe out of the six electrons, there might be two or three electrons getting shared and some of them got attracted to hydrogen. Sorry, this iron catalyst over here. But anyways, whatever happens, that's known as step number one, that's called adsorption with a D. What that means is that reactant molecules, they end up forming weak bonds with catalyst.
and they get adsorbed on the surface of the iron catalyst. So reactant molecules form weak bonds with catalyst. And it's in this way that the triple bond kind of breaks. Like the triple bond electrons are now gone. They attracted to the iron catalyst. And as soon as they bump, the, the molecules are going to uh, bounce back. The H would bounce back, this H would bounce back. So they're not going to stick around because they've got some kinetic energy. I mean, using 450 degree centigrade temperature. So, so they're not going to stick around with iron. Uh, they're going to just come over here, hit the iron, interact with the iron, and then they would be bouncing back. When they bounce back, these bonds are going to break. So basically, at the end of the day, just by one collision with iron, the triple bond automatically breaks off. That was the thing that was stopping the reaction. Now your collisions are going to become more effective because now breaking the triple bond is not going to be an issue now. So that's known as the second part is deadsorption. Deadsorption is that the weak bonds So the weak bonds between reactant molecules and catalysts break. And now new bonds can be formed easily. It's not going to be that much of an issue now to form the new bonds because there is no longer any triple bond. TK, so let me see in image of uh, so just let me see if I can I said no detail is required you don't need uh, mechanisms for this uh, I mean, this one, I'm going to copy this image. So this is what's happening. Uh, the triple bond electrons are kind of getting pulled by the uh, by on the, to the surface of the iron metal because the metal weakly attracts them, uh, and it's a weak attraction. So the bond also breaks very quickly. And here's here's he showing that it, the new bonds can now be formed. Like the n electrons are gone, so the n is now free to form new bonds. Is this clear? Yes. So how do the weak bonds break from the catalyst? That's a good question. Uh, remember, I told you that. Uh, as I told you that, I was stressing on the fact. Wait, wait, just a second. As I, said, I was stressing on the fact that there's a, there's only a very slight tendency to attract electrons. It's not a, unlike non-metals, like non-metals also like to gain electrons, right? But non-metals like to gain electrons very strongly so if if there was no iron and if instead of the iron there was a non-metal then uh, then there would be a very strong bond Adam is this clear they're only slightly attracting those electrons so the so the attraction is not that strong is this clear So, in, so that is the reason why uh, non-metals can't be good catalysts because what a non-metal would do is that it would attract the electrons towards itself and just keep them there. Like it's going to form a very strong bond with the nitrogen. So uh, it won't let go, let go of the nitrogen. 
transition metals they don't really like to gain electrons they just have this tiny very tiny weak attraction for electrons which is enough to kind of weaken the bond so it's just strong enough to pull the electrons towards itself but not strong enough to kind of keep those electrons there forever so so that's why they they kind of like in the middle they that's why they act as really really good catalyst uh so adsorption and deadsorption uh and then in the next class we're going to study the homogeneous catalyst an example of the homogeneous catalyst so in just a second So an example of, uh, I'm just going to do the example, sorry. Homogeneous catalyst. I said, what's going to happen in uh, this homogeneous catalyst is uh, that you'll have uh, the reactant and the catalyst are going to have the same state. And there's one specific example that has to be remembered. So that one specific example is, uh, it's uh, I2 reacting with S2O2 minus And it produces 2i minus 1 plus 2SO4, 2 minus. Let me just think whether I've written the right reaction or not. Uh, S2A to 2 minus, that's uh, gaining two electrons. And I2 is also gaining electrons, so it must be the other way around. Uh, let me just, uh, yes, it's wrong. I mean, this has to be over here. So you have to remember this reaction, 2i minus 1, turning into i2. So 2i minus 1 losing electrons, so that's getting oxidized. S2a2 minus, uh, it's gaining electrons. So that's what's happening. This reaction has a very high activation energy, and Fe2 plus ions or Fe3 plus ions are used as catalyst. So you have to remember the exact uh, mechanism of this, why this uh, uh, reaction uh happens uh why do fe2 plus and fe3 plus act as catalyst now the first thing is i'm going to talk about the high activation energy why does this reaction have a very high activation energy so the thing is that both these ions are negatively charged so if they're negatively charged that means they're going to repel each other so they're, ne they're never going to meet i mean you would have to give them a lot of energy so that they could bump into each other that's why uh, it requires very high activation energy because because otherwise the two ions are never going to meet. If they're never going to meet, uh, there's never going to be a reaction. So to make them meet, a lot of uh, energy is required. Uh, so negative ions repel each other. So high activation energy is needed. to overcome the force of repulsion. Is this clear? I mean, this yes. part. So you need so you need a very high activation energy to overcome the force of repulsion. That's uh, so how can the catalyst that you've added mitigate this? Okay, so the hindrance of the reaction is that both ions are negatively charged and it's very hard for them to kind of bump it to each other. Uh, so we go, we're going to study in the next class how how these iron catalysts, uh, it's either Fe2 plus or Fe3 plus, both are going to work. How can that prevent that, TK? So let's continue this uh, tomorrow then, TK. Okay, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, Lafez.
I see Zoha. You sh Zoha, you should have told me before. Uh, yeah, I forgot. So we can we can continue with this. We can do that later on. Okay. Okay. Take care, Lafiz.